I've always had the instinct to share what I see, hear and feel. And I find myself observing or seeing and hearing and feeling what's around me for almost 16 hours a day. And that makes me believe that it would have been such a pity if the richness of the world that I'm surrounded by would have just merely gone unnoticed. And therefore, a majority of my work comes from my keen observation of, the, of my near, close and real world. And that makes it so hard for me to see my body of work as a project or <laughs> projects as they were. And thus, I choose to call my body of work as my utterances. And if so is the case, let me make an attempt or let me try to make an attempt to share why do I utter what I utter. Many of you who know me, know me as a filmmaker, but I wonder what I do can be called that. Because I question, when does observing become directing? Or when does daydreaming become filmmaking? Because the stories that I deal with find me, my shots are naturally lit. I mostly work with ambient sound. The actors which I deal with are all natural or, 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 or perhaps strangers or rickshawara or my friends, young and old and so on. The, the sequences are, are spontaneous, are improvised in the moment and the creative de decisions are made through my five senses right there. So I feel as if I'm receiving signals like an antenna from everywhere. If I were to give an example, when I sweep or mop the floor, the satisfying movement of the transformation from one to another becomes a visual feast for me. Or when I'm cooking on the chula with my companion, and when I hear this beautiful remark that ye arhar ki dal mein non zara sharma gaya hai. And my God, that evokes a sense of inquiry that to start with, why is the salt shy? Or my relationship and my interaction with the plants and the soil. So all of this, throughout the time that I've spent observing, which is till this moment, I feel and I affirm that my thoughts, my ideas and my observations do have the ability and the capacity to organize themselves on their own. I'm merely presenting it. So I'm, I'm just shopping from my perceptions, if I may. Having said this, let me share some of my recent work. Three summers ago, I was in Washington DC um, working for the Smithsonian Folklife Festival under the wisdom of Charlie Weber and with the great company of Albert Tong, Fabulous Minds. And I was working on a video series called Culture Out Loud. And the attempt was to bring out cultural nuances of Armenian pottery or Catalonian food or African kente weaving through these small videos, um, video piece series, Culture Out Loud. So Albert and I spent our afternoons on the National Mall observing, just merely observing. But what was special for me was that while I was there, on one hand, I was trying to familiarize myself with the fancy camera equipments and heavy duty editing softwares and so on. But on the other hand, I had also developed an interest or attraction towards Dingar Sahitya. And both of these interests had the potency to create dynamic visions. 
but what do I mean by their ability to create dynamic visions? I would want to dare and <laughs> give an example of a small piece of a larger piece by a great poet, Kavi Dulabhaya Kag. And that small piece goes like Hardadam, Khardadam, Bharmand, Hale, Dadadam, Dadadak, Radak, Bajay, Jaradam, Dagajwal, Karal, Jare, Sachram, Thadadam, Gana, Saj, Sajay, Kaad ke ghar ni Kaadadam, Kaadadam, Hardadam, Mukhnath, Grajant, Hare, Parameshar, Mod, Dhari, Pashupalan, Kaam, Prajalan, Naach, Kare, Ji, Kaam, Prajalan, Naach, Kare. This is beautiful. And just the meter creates visions, um, visions for me. And I found the same uh, ability and the same process while I was observing those cultural nuances. And therefore, Albert and I, we, we, <laughs> we tried to create, let me try to get this right, onomatopoeia, but visual onomatopoeia through these small video piece series and it was a great experience. Another utterance I would like to mention is this film I made on block printing and architecture called um, Printing Architecture Block by Block. It's on the artwork of the artist Swapna Tamhane um, who, is, who is based in Canada and it's a, the, the artwork is to be exhibited at the Royal Ontario Museum in Canada. Her artwork is a mobile palace, soft architecture, with each panel hand block printed, hand dyed, but each panel being unique, but part of the same architecture. Um, so while I was filming there, I absolutely fell in love with the village and the block printer, Saleh Mohammed Khatri, and his firm blue shake hand and his, his flavorful and colorful smile but the whole process the the filming process became very rhythmic and musical for me as you can imagine what block printing would be there is when he's printing his normal ad adrak print there's a sense of monotony there's rhythm his his body moves with beats and so on but when he was printing Swapna's work I, I saw I observed that he lacked that he because each panel was absolutely unique, he could not have um, rhythm or he could not have repetition as it were. But there I found non-repetition to be emerging prominently and I saw parallels between her artwork and a ghazal because ghazal is an ensemble of various couplets or a series of couplets, share. And it's 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 same as a work, no? That each panel is unique but are part of the same architecture. But then what about the radif and kafia of the share? The the sense of repetition, rhythm. I found that the beats didn't have repetition of course, but the Kali between the beats had a repetition. So this was an absolutely new experience for me and a new observation that the absence of Radif and Kafia became the Radif and Kafia and this film became my small little ghazal on her work through my fascination of the block printer and the block prints. I would also like to mention quickly a film I made called Each Mango A Love Letter with a, currently a New York based artist and this film was shown at the Happy Family Night Market at the Abrons Art Center in New York and the film works with the idea that mangoes aren't just merely um, the national fruit of India or seasonal delicacy but it's also a um, metaphor of desire so the 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 shots were non-linear but were fairly intimate and the editing 
was quite slippery, uncertain, and fad fad fadi gardo, as so many mangoes are. So we spent our afternoons filming in each possible fruit market in the old city of Ahmedabad, and trying to build intimacy, and and capture nuances and our our engagement with mango. So the 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 gestures of our hand when we aprajare carry goriye, the the movement of the hand or the the involvement of the tongue in the lips when we lick the hairy mango pit or or the 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 flies and the bees fancying the cut mango and so on and that showed me that how can visual narrative also develop a f a f physical sensation like desire with an object so intimate to us or especially in the south asian context like mango but before i get lost into my metaphysical world and i mean and and bore bore people even more i would want to trace back to i said that i find myself observing and seeing and hearing and feeling and tasting and so on for almost 16 hours a day and that and why do i see what i see has really helped me identify why do i do what i do and this this is an attempt to loud think why do i utter what i utter but i also have a fear ke badu kachu na kapai jaye i mustn't rush i must be friends with the lento i've learned recently and i do find myself in these positions where i'm i'm speaking or i'm receiving something or i'm being recognized and so on but i still want to see my ideas my observations my body of work or my utterances in all its possible incarnations and therefore i absolutely mustn't end i absolutely mustn't end without saying that i have yet to bloom a thousand times more at least thank you